what we have in our minds and we bring it out into a way that we can express it visually with the world. Everything around us is designed. That room upstairs on the 11th floor, wow, gorgeous design. Um, if you really take a look around you, this building in particular, every single thing in here has a very conscious design behind it. So what this is about is designing on the web. We're going to tell a story, always, with whatever we put out there. It's not always a story we want to tell, right? So um, my goal here is to show you how not to have your site look like this. Um, <laughs> or this one. Not quite as bad, but, but still. Pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Not sure what they were thinking. This one actually has a slider, so it's, it's not that outdated, um, but it's, it's interesting. And yes, this is the entire page. <laughs> um, this one I just had to show you live because this is a hoop. Um, very interesting content. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs>
It's not what we're about. Not for this. We want to keep it simple. <laughs> we want to keep it simple. Um, best practice for your colors in any design, but particularly your website. Um, one or two main colors that complement each other, and an accent color, which is also called um, a conversion color. So, for example, we've got two shades of one color, which is fine. You can use multiple shades. And then we've got a, a second color here and our accent color. And that usually means that we're going to use that color for when we want people to do something. So here's some examples of our two main colors. These are three different color schemes. Two, three, two, two. And then the accent color. And so this is just a quick example. There's a million different combinations, obviously. Um, for this particular site, we might have the background be um, the yellow, or toned down version of that yellow, and then some blue, and then the accent color might be the buy buttons for the links. So that's what that conversion color is for. It's what do we want to use that for when we want people to do something next? Okay? Any questions so far? Feel free to raise your hand if you do. Um, for choosing color schemes, I often use a photo. I just, I really like to take a photo from nature, for example, because in nature all the colors go together. They just do. I don't know how, but they just do. So you take a photo and you might pick out some colors out of that, which is kind of cool. Um, this is a tool that's available online through Adobe. It's called Cooler. And you can use this to make a color scheme. A lot of time playing around this with <laughs> sliders. So here's the green, and it tells you some complementary colors. The blue, maybe that purple is an accent. So there's a, a neat tool for you. And I'll have the slides up on Slide Deck um, after the session. Another tool is Color Lovers. This site is kind of cool because it's all user generated color palettes and patterns even. You can get patterns from here too. So if you're on the if you go to browse and you can go to palettes and you can actually see some color schemes that people have submitted. And granted they're using more than the cup just the basic two colors, but um, you can really get some good inspiration and if you like some of these, you can actually use them. And there's patterns as well. You can also make your own color schemes on the site. So this, this is something to be, these aren't the coolest patterns, but you see what I mean. <coughs> okay, question on color. Yes? I've actually, um, a cooler is a great tip that looks really cool. Um, I found a really helpful trick um, it's called Instant Eyedropper, and I found that it's like a little, I mean, you've heard of this, I see that look on your face. You can literally pick out a color from a, a picture. Because I had, I had a client who was like, um, I have this pen and I really love the color of my pen. <laughs> How do I get that color? I'm like, well, send me a picture of it. And you can literally get the HTML code for any pixel in a, in a photo, and I found that really, really helpful. You can. It's, um, it's very cool. When we go back to the web, I'll give you an example of that. Um, one thing with the pictures, I, I use a similar tool, I don't know if it's the same tool or not, but um, I'll often post color schemes out of a photo on my website. So if you're ever looking for some inspiration for color, go to scrogamedia.com. You'll see them every now and then. Um, okay, typography. Exactly, this, this is just a definition off of Wikipedia. The art and technique of arranging type in order to make language visible. Pretty simple, right? Well, when you get into it, it's not quite so simple we have so many choices. We have our serif that has the little, the little feet, um, the sans serif, we've got wide fonts, light fonts, narrow, display fonts, we've got I mean, crazy, now we have wingding fonts and um, fonts that have all capitals, tons and tons of handwritten fonts. Um, and when you're choosing fonts, there's some guidelines. And again, I'm definitely in the camp of keeping it simple. Clear and easy to read. Some fonts are easier to read than others. There's just no doubt about it. Especially in your body copy. 
body text. Um, like Helvetica is easy to read. Um, George is easy to read. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, but one thing that's really important to point out is that we're not we're not limited to what we call um, web safe fonts anymore, which are like basically our computer system fonts. Then maybe we had ten or so, um, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute how we can use more. But we are unlimited, and we are only limited by um, the licensing for the font. So again, I'll show you that in a minute. But clear and easy to read. Just like color, we're going to use one font, maybe two, for our website project. Any more than that, and we get this. When you use too many fonts, they all fight for your attention. It's too complicated. Our brain can't easily comprehend. And so people are just going to check out. Opposites attract. Um, a fat font with a skinny font, serif with a sans serif, it's things like that. Um, try to make them different from <coughs> each other. Line height, we'll show you in a second. Line height is really important. Um, you may have heard about that yesterday in one of the sessions. And again, unlimited choices for web. So here's two paragraphs. Um, which one do you think is more readable? Oh, the green check. Oh, the green check, right? <laughs> that was that's really easy for you to sign a day. So lines are spaced a little bit further apart than that. It's a little harder on the eyes to focus on. And the longer your line, the longer your content area, the larger the spacing should be. And again, you can take that too far and just go have kind of the opposite effect. Yes? Are there any, are there any uh, main rules to design about left justification versus full justification on the web? It really depends on the flow of the page. I, um, you guys hear me suspecting? I like left justified. You know, I, I don't do the, what is it, justified on both. Um, that is really hard to read because then you have crazy spacing, font spacing on a line. Um, and again, it, it really depends on the project. As a general rule, I go left justified. I don't do a lot of center. Um, I just don't. It's not my style. Some people do. Every designer has their own style. Right justification, not so much unless you're arranging something on a page and it makes sense. Um, once you do this for a while, you have a sense of what, what looks right and what doesn't. So you really, it's all about practice. Line height. H1s, H2s, H3s, it's code. Ah. Um, but it's hierarchy. It's H hierarchy. So our H1 is typically our, our page title headline, right? And hierarchy gives the page structure. So it tells the reader these are the things that are the most important. And unless they change the SEO again, there is still some SEO benefit to hierarchy. H2, typically from a design perspective, H1 is the biggest, H2 is a little bit smaller, H3 is smaller still, and oftentimes I'll have that in a completely different font. So that would be my second font, or a different color. So maybe it's the same font, different color. Um, the font in your logo doesn't count. Um, the font in your body text does. And then bolding, like you could have an H4, H5, H6, H6, it doesn't, I don't get into that, it's like one, two, and three. Maybe four is really just bolded text. Um, I don't think you need to get any more complicated than that. <coughs> so a couple of tools that you can use to find web fonts. Really easy. Um, Google is awesome. Their Google fonts, they're all free. You can download them to your computer. You can use um, their either little snippet of code to embed them on your website. So if you say, I want to find, let's find a display or a handwriting font, and it should refresh. Um, we can review it, or we can just go right ahead and use it. 
and then it tells us the code that we need to add to our website. And it gives us a couple of different ways to do that. So we can import it from the Google API. We can use some JavaScript if we want to. And then it gives us a CSS to put into our CSS file. Really easy. And they're constantly adding fonts. <coughs> some of them are better than others. I mean, some of them are absolutely gorgeous, and others I wouldn't touch with a 10 feet pole. But um, for the most part, I mean, there's a lot to choose from there. And then another tool that gives you just as many choices in a different way is Font Coral. Um, these are all free for commercial use. Great, great, great free font um, resource. You can download them. You can, if you have a font on your computer and you want to use it, they have a web font generator. And as long as your license allows it, like Adobe fonts, you can't upload. Um, but as long as your fonts license allows it, you just <coughs> click that, um, and there's an add fonts button. Font file, and you upload it, and it will create um, a kit for you, a web font kit. <coughs> you then take the CSS and the code and you put it on your site. Does it generate for the for the I know that Does it generate for what? Uh, uh, does it generate for Internet Explorer but because I know that it needs a special kind of font. Yeah, um, it does work on Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is always going to have some things that it doesn't like. I use this all the time on client websites and I've never had a problem. So we basically need to be to basically need three different kind of font right? It gives you all of them. In your kit, it gives you all of the formats that you're going to need. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Really great resource. Yeah, I use Fonts a lot. And so you can, you know, if you want to just look around and find some, um, there's tons. And you can filter, um, and then you can download onto your own computer, like I said, and then up, upload to the web. And then this one I just found yesterday, actually. It's kind of cool. There's some sites out there that will automatically pair fonts for you. And this one gives you some, <coughs> some choices. So they've kind of already done the work. But really, just, just play around and look at all the different resources out there. And um, I will ask you, I will ask everybody, please choose responsibly. We are a Fortune 500 company, <laughs> not a lemonade stand. Please don't use comic books. <laughs> um, if you've got the bad rap, if you're making a comic book, it's definitely the one to use. Um, or a child's poster for your kids' preschool. But other than that, not really what we use for um, <coughs> professional projects. Questions on fonts? Yes. This is maybe a personal preference thing. Um, I, uh, oh, sorry, do you want to use that? A uh, quick question about um, upper or lower case. Mm -hmm. I, upper case seems to be really popular and really eye-catching these days. Personally, I think it feels like yelling and shouting and angry and aggressive. How do you feel? Depends on the font. Depends on the project. Um, on my website, I use primarily a lower case. Um, I don't even use sentence case on my own site. Um, I think that in a, in a headline or, you know, something like that that you want to call attention to, all caps is fine, but absolutely it can be overused and it is it can definitely be perceived as shouting. Great point. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. So grids and layout. Um, with responsive design, this has really kind of gone out the window, but I want to show you the basics on grids. Um, we want things to be lined up well so that they're visually pleasing. And we have, what, three seconds, maybe five, when someone gets to our website, and they're going to decide if they like it, they want to stay and stick around for a while, or they're just going to take off. So yes, the code's important. Yes, everything else that we learned about this weekend is important. It still has to look good. So a grid, you'll see, this page, these are three columns. I didn't do the whole grid, but everything is really lined up. Right? This is just a poster, this isn't a website. But this is a website, and it's very, um, it's built on a grid. 
we've got the four sections here. These two rows really um, are the rest of the upper part of the site, so they work in a grid even though everything doesn't have to line up exactly to the edges. But it's, um, you don't have things all willy-nilly on the page. Now, this site you might think, oh, well there's, it does look like things are kind of arranged erratically, right? And then lower down the page, so it really is built on a grid. And this is uh, Charity Water, is a really great example of a well-built or well-designed website. And again, they have grid. Lower down the page, still have that grid. And they have, they've broken it down even further, so this section takes up three of the columns, and this one has a five. Questions on grids? I'm moving too quickly, and I wanted to make this lightweight for you and um, less code heavy, but please stop if you need me to. Red space and padding. Let's not crowd everything, right? We, we all need some breathing room. Um, minimalistic design. Designer knows he's achieved perfection, not only when there's nothing left to add, but when you can't take anything else out. You can't take anything else out without degrading the design. It's a really cramped. A little smaller line height. So this is a photo, and just there's not a lot of space there. This just feels better. Okay. <coughs> yes. Anybody awake? Can we do some jumping jacks? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's eh. um, this is a nice example of a site. This is, this is local. This is the Boston Salon um, that I found when I was. Googling, and they've got, you know, they've got a nice layout there, they've got the grid work in, a lot of white space, a lot of breathing room, elegant, simple. And this is another one. I actually want to show you this one live because it's really cool. Uh, there's very little on this page, right? They've got two colors, black and blue. Blue is, is their um, conversion color, and white is their background. But when you click on it, Here's where you come, and as you scroll down the page, again, there's a couple of columns, lots of white space, very simple, very clear. Um, not a lot to it, but this is a very well-designed website, and just because it doesn't have a lot on it doesn't mean it didn't take a lot of time to do. Go through the non designers web book by Robert Williams at any point? No. Oh, when I was taking Greenweaver, that was like the first primer for us. Oh, yeah? No, I've never heard of that book. The non designers web book. Non designers web book. It's a quick read, it's got a lot of damage. Not as deep as you. But. So I'll, I'll check that out. Well, who was the author again? Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Not the, not a yak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Designer. I'll check that out. Okay, uh, moving on to images. Photos. We can have the best colors, the best typography. We still need some photos. It's not just what it looks like, it's how it feels. All of what we've been talking about goes along with how the visitor feels when they hit our website. This is the page. Here's some text. Choosing photos, really important. <coughs> Respect the photographer. If you're um, using something that you found on a photo site, make sure you give credit to the photographer. I'll give you some resources in a minute on where you can find good photos. Um, don't just grab photos off the web. Don't Google something, grab a photo, and use it. Even, even with giving credit <coughs> to the site, um, 
if you're using something for commercial use, you have to have the proper licensing rights. There's just no two ways about it. Okay. Um, use images that are relevant. We're not going to put Iron Man on our ADHD side, are we? Um, use images that reflect, reflect the mood. So a yoga site might have some stones, might have some lavender. Um, they're not, again, going to have Iron Man. Quality counts. If you have a great camera and you can take some well-lit, professional-looking photos, there's some great cameras out there that can do a lot. Um, but make sure that, you know, if you have if you're making a hotel site, if those guest rooms have the proper lighting, have the proper staging, that they look professionally done. Because it's going to reflect on what your customers think. I've worked with a, a fair amount of clients that take their own pictures and they, they give me like hundreds of pictures and I just, I can't use any of them. And I have to have a really hard conversation with them that says, you know what, you really need to invest a little bit of money and get a professional to do this for you. So it makes a huge difference. Um, Web resolution, you probably all know 72 DPI and use optimization tools, whether you use Photoshop um, or use an online tool or something like that, um, just so that you're not using 300 DPI images on the web that will slow down your site, because we know how important speed is. JPEG and PNG formats are best. I use PNGs when I have, um, when I need a transparent background. Otherwise, I use a JPEG most of the time, because the files are smaller. Um, sight lines is something, I don't really have a, a visual for you, but um, think of, you know, you have an image of um, a businesswoman, right? And she's looking, and you have a buy button here. And she's looking over here. Or she's faced like this with her hands crossed. And you see so many photos now. Um, <laughs> kind of over that, but. And she's looking that way. But if, if you flip that photo, and she was looking down towards your buy button, or up towards your newsletter sign up box, right? Your, your eyes are going to follow where she's looking naturally. So pay attention to how um, the photos you choose are working with your content. Great place to find images. Ever heard of Comp Fight? Anybody? Yes. Um, Comp Fight pulls its database from, um, from Flickr. Really cool. Um, let's just search for images above this line are stock photos that you can buy. Everything below that line is from Flickr. So you can click on a photo, and if you hover over it, it tells you the dimensions that it's available in. You can even say, I don't really want that one, so I'm going to X that out. Usually works, but um, we'll use this one as an example. Usually you can X them out and they just disappear. Um, but this photo, it tells you what sizes you can download it. And then it allows you to download it, but it also gives you this code to copy and paste so that you give a photo credit to that photographer. Really, really important. And before you choose a photo, over here, you can choose your Creative Commons license. So you can select, I only want images that I am licensed to use commercially. So you don't have to worry about everything else out there. Everything below this line, you are able to use if you embed that code. Yes. There's a WordPress plugin for that. There is a WordPress plugin. Yep. Yep. I tend to not use the plugins, but yes, there is. What's it called? I think it's just Comp I think it's Comp Fight. Yeah. 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 Really good resource. Yes. Uh, Creative Commons has its own search tool as well. That'll search Google. Uh, all the different Everything? places, yeah. Oh, cool. If you go to their website. Yeah. Okay. I'll check that out. Thank you. Um, if you choose to go the paid route, I use iStock Photo when I need stock photography. It's um, I find it's the, the most reasonably priced with the best selection, <coughs> you know, without getting super, super expensive. Um, they, they, their pricing has definitely increased in the past six months to a year, but it's still fairly reasonable. <coughs> so I stock photos is a good resource. And this 
is really, you know, our design has to relate to our audience, our customer's audience. If it doesn't, then it's not any good. Yes? Before I forget, I would like to add something to the image. Because I am a designer and I work, I work with the developer. And what I noticed is that, you know, they, even, they use the 75 DPI most of the time, but the images are not cropped. So mm, sometimes yes. the images are huge and they just shrink it down to the size what the what the website is. <coughs> mm -hmm. But it's still a huge amount of data. Absolutely. So if you embed something, then you know, you should choose the correct uh, image size. That's yes. one thing. And the other thing is that don't just pull the image. So <laughs> you know, you have a 400, 400 pixel size. Uh,
framing and such. But for quick resizing, it is great on that. I think you can do the same thing in paint on Windows, but it's been a while since I've been on a Windows machine, so I'm not sure. Um, we were talking about the color dropper. I use this little thing in Fireshop, or excuse me, Firefox, um, where I can click on it, and it gives me this little crosshair, and I can drag it around, and I can choose all kinds of colors. So then I click on a color that I want. It will automatically copy that to my clipboard, um, or I can click this little drop down, and I can copy all the any different value that I need, RGB or um, perhaps anything. And if it isn't quite right, I can click on that, and I can just drag this around until it's perfect. And again, I've got my values all right here. So that's a Firefox add-on. What's Col Colorzilla, and it's, Col they make it for Chrome. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, one of the great things in WordPress is that the themes do so much the layout for us that we can populate it with the content. But one of the challenges that I face at least is how to come up with a good header image. Hmm. Can you give us any wisdom just to point us in the right direction for headers? Yeah, I mean, using these practices that we just talked about, I mean, Again, depending on the project, um, a nice logo um, logo type made out of type is nice if your customer doesn't have one. I don't use a lot of um, like photos and such in a header, but it, it depends on, again, what the project is. Um, make sure it's balanced. Colors are, are going to match. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, and, and definitely, um, again, depending on the site, you might want something that's really bold and stands out with, you know, big fonts and without being over the top, and then maybe it's, you know, for a, um, like a very basic site, sometimes the header is the main graphic on the entire page, and then you just have some fonts um, that you do a font replacement, and that's enough for the design. Where can I find the slides? Um, I'm going to post them. Um, and I'll put a link out on Twitter. I have a, a fairly long drive home tonight, so when I get home, I'll post them. So you'll see them by the morning. Everyone, you have a question about uh, design. How do you embed or how do you take into account the research about eye movement as the page? Yeah, um, you, were you in the SEO section? Uh, no, it was question yesterday. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, Crazy Eye is a great tool if you don't use that already. Um, and it will actually give you, it will give you a, um, a visual of where people are looking. So it will actually give you like different colors on their page if like you can put a, um, a website up. And it will tell you what people are looking at by where their mouse is and what they're clicking on in your design. I and mean, you can use that as research for if you have a page that's already there uh, as a way to maybe make some edits. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? I'm just wondering if uh, there's anything you can say about um, how much your, your information should be broken up into different sections or pages, or whether you should have one long page, or if there's anything that you use as a rule of thumb. Yeah, it used to be that um, above the fold was, you know, we had to have everything above the fold, and we had lots and lots of pages so that things didn't fall below the fold. That's not really the case anymore, especially with mobile. I mean, people are, they expect to scroll. That said, um, ridiculously long pages, you could certainly break up. I, I tend to say, you know, four or five, and three posts, three blog posts, it's about the limit of the world, break it off to the next one. Um, without, yeah, I, I allow for scrolling, and I, I don't design against that, but, you know, use your judgment. You don't want to lose the user, but um, I think if they can get to the information that they need with the least amount of clicks is really important. Yes? This is maybe a last question. Um, do you think that whole page design and what they put on the home page is changed over the period of time? Because what I see, what I am 
my feeling is that, you know, we used to start, let's say, seven years ago. Platform, this and this company is homepage, and we have some intro. But what I do lately is more like put a lot of content and a lot of information. So people, so I don't bother people with platform in our page because they know that we are, that they know they are on this page. Right, right. But we need, you know, visual information as much as possible. They, that's a great question. And um, and they, they do need information. I, you know, don't put what well, mine um, Again, it's an old the thing we used to do. We don't, they, need, they know where they are, right? That said, I don't put a ton of information. I don't recommend putting a ton of information on your homepage. What I do recommend is that you're very clear what you want the customer to do next. So your call to action needs to be really clear on your homepage. So maybe it's sign up for the newsletter. So you make that button really big, and that's what they're going to do. Maybe they it's a link to hire you. Maybe it's a link to go buy something. Um, pick one thing, maybe two, that is really important, and design around that. Most people aren't going to come into your website and land on your homepage if they're coming from somewhere else. Okay. Um, so the other pages are really one where you want to expand your content, and your homepage is is like an introduction. It's a combination of an introduction and a soft sell. Here you are. What, here's what I want you to do next. That's that's the way I design. That's the answer question. Yeah. I just, oh yeah. 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 And again, it's going to depend on the site. It really is. If you guys are local, be sure to check out the Boston WordPress meetup. We meet here once a month. Um, I can't remember what it was anymore. Meetup.boston.org. Um, and we should have videos up in, uh, I'd say, oh, give it a month or two, maybe even three. <laughs> <laughs> The presentation's only for Saturday and Sunday, with the exception of one or two, because someone designed their slides. Uh -huh. There's one. There's only one. Oh, there's one. Okay. And if you didn't pick up your shirt, visit the uh, registration desk. Thanks, guys. <laughs>